I got an interesting email the other day, um, largely about drawing and learning how to do art on your own without really any feedback. It's a hard position to be in, and you know the interesting thing is when you leave school, even if you're trained, you're back into that situation. The frustration that this person had, they said that they that everything they did always looked flat or warped, um, super common. They wanted to be able to capture form, light, and shadow. Um, they're following. Uh, Scott Robertson's book, but they found it too technical. They wanted to capture forms and really capture values. And they were asking, is that a well-defined goal? And should someone at my skill level um, work on projects or work on short sketches? For the simple sketch of the mushroom and apple, uh, they said they took two hours. And for the shoe and still life, it took um, six to seven hours over several days. Let's look at the work and see and kind of go through and answer all of those questions as we look. Okay. Here we have the mushroom. We're going to skip over the shoe because the mushroom is a little bit simpler. The basic idea behind drawing something like a mushroom is to analyze the shape first, and you've done that really well. The the thing that you did next was you immediately went from the shape to the rendering and that means you went straight for the light and sought to follow the exact lighting conditions that you saw and the exact value of the mushroom and chase that as far as you can go and if we're drawing you know we might take a sphere and wrap a little line around it to kind of show some dimension and to split the shadow and dark side, and then do a little cross hatching and just kind of put some value down roughly where it goes and sketch it out. And this gives you the idea of a sphere in a really minimal and fast way. Um, if we're rendering, we're gonna get out our soft materials like vine charcoal, blending stumps, soft round brushes if you're working digitally, and begin to very gently and slowly lay out this uh, the sphere and we're going to pay attention to the shadow core and we're going to be sure that the the light is keyed exactly correctly that it's neither too bright nor too dark and we're just going to follow the light for hours and hours and hours I mean you could spend five six seven hours just rendering a sphere if you were very careful with it um, time kind of operates a little differently than when rendering was incredibly popular in, in the art academies. And we need ways to do things faster should we want to do that, um, especially when we're studying. We want to get a lot of mileage in when we're studying to see what's really essential to get things across. So we want to spend less time rendering and more time drawing, especially early on. Uh, this is going to relate to the question that you had about uh, doing projects and stuff too. So. If we break this mushroom down into its two basic shapes, we have a triangle and a rectangle. And already it kind of looks mushroomish, even with straight lines. We want to ditch the straight lines as soon as possible and replace them with something better. But we still want to hang on to that basic shape because it's very readable. So if we make an asymmetrical triangle, that'll help to get this to feel more organic. And we'll transition the sides and the top of the triangle using arcs that we've hopefully practiced in our um, warm-up exercises. And we can shape the mushroom however we want. We can shape it with S-curves, inside arcs, outside arcs, and make it all connect. This particular mushroom kind of follows a triangular arc, and we can chase that through. And if we use an S-curve at the bottom, that kind of gives a little style and a little uh, variety that we didn't have at the beginning, but we're still really trying to hang on to that triangle. And that's what's important in terms of getting the shape language across. And then for the stem, we probably want to throw that out and across and try to get it to feel organic and varied, but not draw too much attention to the stem because it's more about the mushroom. And then if we have that S curve, we can probably see a little bit of the underside of the mushroom and we can lay that in through the back. And this is immediately going to create some extra depth that we didn't have using the uh, 
um, other kind of techniques. And you'll notice that there's a front, a middle, and a back side. And I'm sure you've seen this drawing before, this little diagram of overlap where, with three squares, where to get depth, all you have to do is put one thing in front of the next, especially if they're recognizable objects. So we do that with the mushroom, and it buys us a lot of depth. So if we go back to the one that you've drawn, we can kind of draw on top of it and make some slight changes to get this thing to hopefully read a little bit better or to at least point out some concepts to think about. I don't want to say that you've done anything wrong with it per se, but there's more you can be thinking about and more you can more you can do. Because um, you said you weren't happy and you thought it was a little bit flat, so maybe we can point out some concepts to help you get that dimension. And here we're just repeating the same thing about making the mushroom a little more dynamic, um, pushing the asymmetry, hanging onto that triangle, but making it a little more organic. And this is where we're kind of probably deviating from the reference that you've had. Um, you know, that's the other thing too, is references are just references. They're there to get a good drawing. They're not there for you to copy exactly. Um, Early on, you'll probably find yourself sticking to the reference greatly, but you may change that later. So here, what we're doing is determining the, the light angle that you had originally, and we can continue with that. Um, so you can see where the light wraps around the original stem, and so we have kind of a like a 30 degree angle um, uh, light. And because it's a triangle, the most recognizable um, form that we have related to that triangle is a cone. And you can see that the shadow falls just left of center on the original stem. So we know that we're going to be kind of backlit and and from the side a little bit. We want to avoid that center lighting, if at all possible, because it divides it 50-50. And when things get divided 50-50 in their shapes, then things flatten out. And by avoiding that, we just save ourselves a lot of time and problems. One of the things that I did um, a lot in school was just take the dark side and cover it with the tone. And by tone, I mean about 50% of whatever your material can do as far as how dark it can get. So like if you're using pencil, it can get like, you're gonna use like the middle pressure and try to get it fairly dark, but you're not gonna push it all the way. And you don't want it to be super light either. And this introduces this is kind of the beginning of the introduction of, of the five value system for laying out values, um, and especially for drawing objects on your own. So what you have is you have a tone, a shadow core, and an absolute dark. You have a half tone, which in this case is the paper because it's tone paper, and then you have your white and highlight. Um, and each of those is related to a piece of shadow anatomy, which is why it's such a good system, because uh, on the dark side, you go tone, core, and and cast shadow or drop shadow, and on the light side you go half tone and highlight. So here, what we do is we take our core tone and we put that in the shadow core, which is the darkest part of a shadow on an object, because that's where the light hits at a tangential angle to it. Um, the cast shadow, we just go ahead and put put down dark on the ground, um, and then we want to preserve a little bit of the half tone in there and use some of the highlight and lay that highlight in. Um, we might need to tweak and play with it and erase and change some shapes, but the basic idea is that we get that going. You can also take some of the tone and put it on the other side of the shadow core so that you soften the shadow core on both sides. And here I'm using a very um, a hard brush in Photoshop to kind of make a clear decision about where that, that is. Um, you could use softer blending materials and it may work out a little bit better. Um, or in, term, in terms of like getting a polish and finish, finished look, you know, if you were to, to lay this in in pencil, you would of course use the side of the pencil, not the tip. Um, and so if we kind of keep our cone as a reference, we can use that to determine how we want to lay out our lighting situation here. So what we might do is just take our core and begin to lay in our shadow core on this uh, mushroom here uh, with its new shape. And so we're going left of center at sort of that same diagonal that we used in the cone. So we did that cone for practice and now we're doing like the real thing. So this is kind of an interesting way to go about it. 
and we're bringing it off the edge and sort of wrapping it around um, because the, the shadow really does come from the back to the front of this object. And so we hook it around and that kind of creates that illusion that it's going all the way around here. And you can take your time with this and, and sort of blend it out and um, be sure that it's transitioning as slow or as quickly as you need it to. And then you come in with the tone. In this case, the tone's kind of actually lightening up things, um, mostly just because of the way things were photographed. Your, your tone actually was pretty good um, that you laid in in pencil. Um, general theory of working on this is you, could, you just start blending these in and you start fading them back and forth into each other and they can work out pretty well. If you're using just pencil, you'll have a that reference chart to your side and you want to just hit the tone pretty accurately. Um, then we're coming in with half tone and then we're going to hit the highlight. And you know, you don't want full white except in the places where it's shiny. I mean, some mushrooms are pretty shiny, so you may have like a jump where there's a, a shiny spot and you want to save some room for that in your value structure. And again, going back to the half tone and um, covering everything up, making sure that we get lots of that half tone, and that there's a distinct dark and light difference when we look at it. So if we zoom out a little bit, yeah, we can definitely see that that's kind of happening. And we can take our time with, uh, you know, with a hard round brush here and um, really get out to the edge and fill that tone out so that the tone's operating as a dark. Um, because we are working in the dark side. And there's actually a whole style of drawing and painting, um, which you would call like graphic style, which is hard edges and, and sharp shapes. And what's neat about that style is you can use subtle value shifts um, to get things across. But in terms of learning, it's really cool because it forces you to kind of make clear decisions about all of the shapes that you use, including all of the shadow and light shapes. So um, maybe this isn't the best for producing like a finished rendered work, um, but it's good for learning because what this is teaching you to do is lay out roughly uh, or like deciding like very clearly where the bits of shadow anatomy are. And when you're beginning and kind of self-policing and self-checking your work, um, I think that's important. You want to develop sort of these methods of determining what to look for in your own pieces, basically. So here, now we have basically a cylinder that we're going to work on. And we're going to go left of center and lay in the shadow core. Um, we're moving this over, so we're going to have to paint over the, the original dark stuff. But we're going to use basically the same process. Take the shadow core, put the tone on that side, and lay that in all the way out to the edge, being careful to actually fill up all the space and close up the shape. Then we're going to run into the half tone, put that on the light side, and that's going to lay out this cylinder. We may or may not get a little bit of highlight. It depends on the texture, but we're definitely going to get a, a cast shadow. And that shadow is going to get cast from the mushroom cap onto the stem and wrap around some of the mushroom stem and sort of disappear into the tone. Um, and then you would get a ground shadow too, but we don't need to lay that in to make the object clear. We're just sort of practicing um, as far as this goes. So we can take some time and kind of blend it together and soften up the edges. This is the interesting thing about um, using a graphic style is that if you're working digitally or even if you're working analog, you can start with the graphic style and then smooth and blend everything out after. Um, I think that's a pretty valid tactic because it helps you go through the decision making process more um, more readily and anything that makes it easier is good because you know art's hard enough already drawing is pretty difficult um, I would say and because as you get better too like certain things get easier but other but it overall stays difficult because 
you have um, more ambitious things that you want to do. And as your ambition increases um, and your skills increase, things stay difficult. And that's, that's a good place to be because you're always going to push yourself to do better. Um, so here I put that highlight in just to try it, and I didn't really like it too much. So I knocked it down a little bit. And you can still see some highlighting, but it's not like the most dramatic thing ever. And you know, I think that's another thing too, is um, one of the nice things about doing sketches a lot and doing small stuff and not doing big projects is that you get to try stuff without it costing you a lot of time and effort. Um, right now we're about 15 minutes into the, to the video and we're about done with this, mm, this mushroom study. And the last thing we have to do is come back and bind up the edges and figure out how we want to use line. You know, if um, line's a valid part of drawing and we can use that to bring clarity to the objects that we draw, make sure the shapes are closed and make sure everything reads. Um, we can use line weight variety. We can use straight lines, curved lines. Um, we can even get into colored outlines and stuff like that if you're interested in using color ever and we can kind of blend what drawing and painting means digitally if you're working analog you definitely want to come back and just bind those edges with a little line but you don't want to go through and put this super even heavy outline around everything because it'll again kind of flatten it um, if you're grouping objects and drawing still life you can actually lose edges completely into shadow and the still life will still work overall. Um, so if we look at the shape of this mushroom, um, turning them off, your original mushroom is fine. You know, there's nothing that I would say is, is wrong with it in terms of getting it to read as a mushroom, right? It's immediately recognizable. It's a good shape. Uh, but what we can do is just kind of push the, the lighting and the forms and, uh, and give you a method that's a little faster. Um, you know, you don't want to spend the hours that you could be getting mileage polishing something that you're not happy with, if that makes sense. Like, you don't want to be unhappy with your drawing and then continue to try to finish it um, when you could just move on to something else that you like better in the beginning. Um, I think that's that's also kind of something about practice methodology that we could work on. So with the shoe, it's more difficult, right? Shoes are harder. It's not a simple form per se, because you're, A, it's organic, and B, it's recognizable and detailed. And sort of like the beginning that you would do is, is draw all the details that you know and try to make it recognizable. And so what you've done with the shoe is actually you've showed us two recognizable angles of the shoe in one drawing, which it's not wrong because there's like examples from every culture where that's done. And if you're trying to go for a realistic like post Renaissance style, that would not be preferred, but it's a, it nonetheless is a valid style in its own right because that is kind of what it is. And if you think about it, you know, the footprint of a shoe is incredibly recognizable, but so is the side. You know, in terms of a foot, like the footprint is kind of the defining thing of how you recognize a foot. And what you've done is kind of included two on here and combine them. So the next sort of idea that I wanted to get across is just that, you know, combining these two is, is kind of funky. Um, and it's interesting because this is something that humanity has drifted naturally towards for ages. And what it winds up looking like to sort of a modern sensibility is, is a, a twisted shoe. Uh, but if you think of ancient Egypt, they were rendering on several different levels. They did have realistic rendering styles, but they also had this, this sort of classic stylized 
way of representing people where the chest would be facing forward, the pelvis would be facing, facing forward, and then the feet would be turned sideways and the head would be in profile. Um, and there would be some kind of headdress or something on. And the less realistic style was reserved for gods and pharaohs and sort of the higher end of the hierarchy. The more realistic representations were for the lower end of the hierarchy. And they, they could be represented in what you would call a relatively realistic style. And I think having that range is potentially really interesting. And you can see with uh, your view of the shoe that you're kind of trying to look down on it a little bit, um, but you're also looking at it um, sort of from the side. So it's kind of it's kind of this mixed thing. One of the nice things about it is that you've noticed a lot of detail. And I think that's that's one of the interesting places to begin, you know, that you've noticed where all of the eyelets are, all of the distinctive characteristics, the seams, um, the way that the shoe is connected um, to itself. And what it comes down to, we have kind of three tools for representation. So we have a single-sided box, which is basically just a rectangle. We have a two-sided box, which is two triangles stacked to each other. And then we have a three-sided box, which is really four triangles stacked together. Um, and we're most used to seeing these types of boxes represented in sort of realistic artwork. And mastering those, I think, is really essential and knowing which one to use when. So in this situation, probably what we want to drift towards is the three-sided box. And that box can kind of be the architecture for the open area of the shoe where you put your foot into it. And then we want to combine that with another sort of subform to kind of get a little wedge there. And if you go back to some other videos on the channel, you'll see plenty on these, these seven basic forms um, and a bunch of varieties of those. So this kind of is a combination of the box and the prism. Um, and it's sort of like um, combining a box and a wedge, um, almost like your ramp, you're creating a ramp to go up. Eventually you ditch this architecture and go straight for the curved forms. But in the beginning, what you wanna do is use this architecture and then overlay the curves on it. So you kind of track that side view pattern along this plane. So you go the from the heel forward to the uh, beginning of the tongue. You can track the arc of the sole all the way around and curve it around and find where it ends. You can add the mock toe seam and curve that around. So what you're doing is you're using curves, but you're thinking boxes and prisms. And you can take the, that architecture and add curves onto it. Now, in terms of creating a finished piece, you would probably want to erase and remove all of those understructure lines. But in terms of learning, you want to leave them to kind of uh, preserve the record of what you're doing and, and make sure that you're following that, that pattern, especially when you're working on your own. And as you add details, they still have to reinforce the, those basic structures. Um, the main difference is on corners, right? So if you have a harsh corner like that, it doesn't really work really what's happening is your corner spreads out along this curve and you have a you do have a defined front and you do have a defined side but you have that period or um that period of transition right so you have that front the transition and you have the side and if you think of it like that it's going to help you create more organic and more complicated objects you can then use that information um, on how to overlay value. And when you go back to the back, of course, you finish out the structure, right? You curve from point to point and you get to a box form, but you use a curve to do it. And early on, you can even draw through the form as if it's a full wireframe structure. And um, so basically what we've done is we've created a, a shoe based on this three-sided box. Um, and we've combined two basic forms. We've got that wedge and the box. 
And we always want to keep coming back to those simple, simple things because the simplest stuff is the most powerful. Um, and if you can get that simple stuff to work, you can get the more powerful stuff to work. If you can get the simple stuff to look really cool, you can get the more complicated stuff to look really cool. Um, I think you have a lot of trouble going straight for the complicated stuff because nobody really knows how to draw a shoe per se. Like they know how to like look at a shoe and break it down into something simpler that you can draw. And we want to focus on our shape, form, and lines because that's our basic components that we have to create everything. You know, shape is the biggest thing and shapes made, made up of lines. So we want to work on our shape quality, our line quality, and explore how we can use shape to create forms. Um, and eventually you do something kind of like this where you go ahead and ditch the basic forms and go ahead and draw curves while thinking of those basic forms. And, you know, here I ran it off the page, so it's kind of a bad example, but you get the idea, right? You can, you know, I'm thinking basic forms, but I'm drawing arcs, right? And you can see the sort of the shoe begin to emerge, you know, and with those basic forms and those details that you've found, the seams and stuff, if you're drawing the shoe from a, any particular angle, those seams that you notice can help you actually define the forms a little bit better, right? So if you block out your sole and put the sole on there, you can find that back of the heel where that seam is and use that to wrap around the heel as if it's coming around behind, continuing around and then stopping. The corner of that wedge form that kind of makes the triangle of the back of the heel winds up being that seam that you have indicated there. And you can use that seam to indicate how the form progresses around the heel. It might even be sort of an arc like that. And if you notice those levels of details and how they relate to the form, you can use those details to help reinforce the form. So that's kind of the way that I like to think about it is all of those details, you know, and you can change them too. Like if you see a detail and it doesn't go along with the form on the shoe, you can change that detail to help you create that form. So I think that's a really powerful way to think through this stuff. And as you change your way of thinking, it's going to change the way that you approach the drawings. And as you think better, you wind up drawing better. And, you know, the point here is to kind of incorporate one thing at a time. So I'm kind of showing you a full path that goes a little bit beyond of like where you are right now and what you want to do immediately next. What you want to do immediately next is get those basic forms. Where you go with it is here, right? You want to end up where you're able to have those forms in mind and draw straight for the curves and arcs and know whether you're drifting off of that immediately. And you're going to want to practice this at some point where you do a study of these basic forms break down, then go next to it and go straight for the arcs. That's kind of the intermediary bridge, right? So that way you have the forms in mind, they're in the position that you want, and then you go straight, straight for it like this, rather than overlaying them on top of each other. Because sometimes you just need to, um, need to force yourself to develop in a certain way. And you always want to trick yourself into doing something slightly more challenging. And you can do a lot of warm up exercises and just keep drawing boxes and, and keep doing things that are basic like this. You know, one of the things that we're talking about with these box forms is doing an organic box form. And it's sort of like if you remember the dice you use in various games where they have rounded edges and they don't have any strict harsh corners. You can see they have these uh, curved flat planes on them and then the corners are curved and you wind up with a, with a die that looks like this. And those transitions are kind of rounded and they go flat and then they round and go flat again. And that's kind of what's happening with shoes. You're creating that, that arc everywhere 
that you're changing plane direction. And I think that's the tricky part of shoes is that they're sort of unforgiving because they're so recognizable. Um, some of the ways you can practice are just by creating little bending planes like this. And you can see that in some of the um, plane exercise videos that I've done before where you just kind of work on these basic planes and it's kind of low stakes, low effort because you're only working on something very simple, very basic, and it's not the end of the world if you mess this up, right? You can work on simple arc planes like this, and this can help you with the idea of continuous transition uh, from plane to plane where it's curving the entire time. And that can help you also work on things like basic cross hatching and so on. The other thing that you'll want to do is if you're having trouble with something tricky, break it down and do a study next to it. So I just did that little arc study. So now I can bring the information that I did back to the transition around the corner of the shoe. And I'm kind of over exaggerating what you would do here so that you, so it's very clear what's happening. So I'm going ar around that corner following with cross hatching, and then I'm going up the length of the shoe with cross hatching. And you can begin to bring out forms in a more dramatic way by using that sort of technique. Um, next, we want to take a look at, I suppose, the, the next stage of everything where you're wanting to get more advanced with the way that you treat objects. And in drawing, uh, it's good to keep in mind that, that everything is an object. Um, you know, everything from a person to a shoe to the project that you're doing, it's all, all objects. And your question was, should I be spending time doing quick stuff or doing long projects. Let's say your project took 200 hours, which that's a long time for a project, but depending on the project, that, that could be a reasonable amount. Um, let's say you're going to spend that much time rendering something. You would want to do several studies leading up to that so that you kind of have a plan. The last thing you want to do is do a giant project that takes you 20, 30, 40, 100, 200 hours and wind up with something you don't like in the end. So these studies that take you anywhere from 20 minutes to three hours are totally worth it because you're not, you're going to throw ideas you don't like away at that stage rather than at the end. So before that too, you're going to do a lot of sketches to get ready to do those studies. So you're going to do like 20, 30, 40, 50 sketches to prepare yourself to be able to do the studies correctly. And you're going to keep those all around when you create this project. So as you go back to the sketch and he's like, well, what did I see in the sketch? What do I like about the sketch? What do I want to incorporate from the sketch into the study and then into the project? Sometimes as you create these sketches, you lose track of what you liked in the sketches that made you want to do the project in the first place. And so you, you need to keep them around to remind yourself of where you were drawn in the beginning. And um, so any project is going to involve a lot of sketches. In the beginning of learning, you probably want to spend more time sketching and doing studies than you do projects. Like I think a reasonable amount of time is to do a two week long project, but that involves sketches and studies along the way. And every day that you go to draw, you're doing exercises, you're doing shapes, you're doing lines, you're doing form exercises, you're doing warm ups, and then you're gonna go into your sketches, then you're gonna go into the, your studies, and then you're gonna put a little bit of time on your project. So I guess the answer isn't really an either or, it's a both and. You know, you're going to be doing sketches daily. And I think 
one of the greatest things you could do is do a 30 minute sketch every day, regardless of what your project is, because, you know, new ideas will come from those 30 minute sketches. And if you do that every day and you generate these ideas every day, you're never going to be a, a loss at what to do. So for instance, we've got the still life project that you're working on and we have, um, an unknown object in the back that looks somewhere between a fish and a stapler. We've got an iron, a book, a complicated boxy object and a wine bottle. So what we'd want to do is separate each of those and when we're doing our sketches and figure out what we need to know to draw each of those. The wine bottle is always fun because it's a very distinctive form and it's just a classic still life object. And we want to break that down. And so we go back to our hierarchy. It's, it's shapes first. And the shape that we use is a rectangle stacked with a triangle, stacked with another kind of uh, transitionary triangle, and then another rectangle. Then we arc that out and we convert it to forms and we convert it to our basic um, cone form and some cylinders. And that gets us a wine bottle. So here we've analyzed the kind of three dimensionality of it. And to check ourselves, we could throw an axis down the middle. We can measure out our proportions and just refine it a little bit more and tailor it to the specific wine bottle that we have in front of us. If we're trying to be really representational and realistic, you can use the label to help with a little bit of that dimension as well, because it's just another thing that helps you remind us that helps you remind everybody that's a cylinder. You can even probably see through it a little bit, depending on if it's empty or full, and you could potentially see the internal structure where you can put your thumb to do like one of those fancy pours that you do with the wine bottle. The book is really simple and um, it can be easy to make a book just look like a box and not make it look like a book. It's just a three-sided box that's very thin and you build something up like this. Now to make it really look bookish you need a few extra details that help you out. Like if it's a hardcover book, you'll see a little dip around the hardcover back towards the seam where they bind it together. It'll have sort of some thickness. The pages might curl and bend and the bottom cover will have some thickness as well. So you can work on building out subforms that are tailored to that specific book that help you get across the idea that you're looking at a book. You can put even, you can even put in little page textures and so on to kind of build this specificity around the book and make it more immediately recognizable. And I think those are really important to do because you want that distinctive quality to come out. I, I like to think of it as tailoring, right? It's like if you buy a suit or a dress or something like that, it's generically cut, but then you want it tailored and cut to the person who's going to wear it and it always looks better in the end. So that's what we're doing here. We're doing a generic box form and we're tailoring it to fit the object that we wanna draw. So here we've got a very complicated object and essentially we wanna start simple. Again, just a three-sided box. And here I'm gonna erase some of the construction lines as I go so that they're not in the way. Um, a lot of times I would just leave it. One of the things that's tricky about um, something that's octagonal or has 45 degree angle corners like this is sometimes you can create a straight line going from the corner to the side and it's a little confusing. So you might have to exaggerate the angle for the drawing or change the angle that you draw the object at so that it looks a little bit better. Here we're creating a, pla a plane that's leaning out and then we're connecting that plane to a couple of the corners so that we create another plane that transitions us around that corner. It's a bit tricky to think of, but it works pretty well in the drawing. We can then add more surface details, like if there's an infrared sensor or some kind of component there, or if there's a seam down the side, we can track that seam down the side and that can help us convey the form as well. And I think these are very important details to get in there because they bring distinction to the object and they help us with the form. And anything that can do both of that at the same time is just fantastic to put in there. I think it all depends though on how well you can draw those basic forms. So if you've done your warm-ups and you've done your exercises, 
where you've drawn those basic forms, it should be relatively easy to continue with it. Um, let's see. So the iron, you know, we want to start simple, right? It's we want to start with that triangle shape of the of the face of the iron. And think about that in perspective, right? We're looking at the iron kind of from the side and we can build out the forms from there. It's more or less continually a curved triangular form and then we put a handle on it. So our iron shape kind of looks like that. It's fairly simple and we put, you know, all the little steam holes and everything to help that along and but I mean once we get that basic iron shape it's very distinctive and it's very easy to track and to follow and if we can get that shape of the f of the bottom face of the iron then everything else is much easier to draw and it'll maintain that distinction no matter where you are and so right here you know we've done the sketch phase for this still life and now we want to do kind of a study that combines all of that information together um, we have it in our memory what the still life looks like and where everything is kind of positioned and we may have to do some stuff to kind of rearrange these objects and reposition them to kind of help them make sense so if we look at your particular still life you know we start with that y for the box form and then we know that we need to change some angles to make the box form make a little more sense and that'll kind of change some of the shapes that you're using and so we want to refine it more like that right we can then work on distinguishing the book a little more like we can you know we did the study in the other direction but we can turn that um, the binding corner towards us more and it's still going to retain the distinction of a book and one of the interesting things about constructive drawing like this is that we can actually draw through forms as if they're sort of transparent and that can actually help us lay out a, a whole structure and as we go we can erase those layers if we do this very softly in graphite you don't actually need to erase very much if you do it digitally you can just draw over everything in different layers and turn layers off and on and erase stuff on different layers and then you can delete old layers and so on um, that's the advantage to kind of drawing digitally disadvantage of digital work is cost of getting started with it although that's getting cheaper all the time so what we've done here is we've stacked two of our forms together and if we need to do another study where we just stack forms on top of each other i think that's totally valid before we go into the full stakes still life so now we have the iron stacked on the book and everything's kind of laid out a little bit better now here we want to make sure when we lay out this complicated object that we don't intersect them or overlap them in a way that doesn't make any sense so we'll want to maybe move the object just a little bit and here i'm playing around with this corner and how i want that corner to look i wanted to show the bottom of that corner so that it makes sense in the space and here what we're doing is we're kind of making judgments about how these objects relate to each other in the space and how they share the same ground plane and if we need to draw out the ground plane we can do that too so here we have that leaning plane out on that object that we practiced and remember it's now turned to a different side so but we're still taking the same ideas the same information we're just turning it to make it make more sense um, and then here I'm gonna draw through and move the wine bottle a little bit and try out a couple of places for it I think uh, you know, putting it over on the right runs it right over to the edge of the page. And if we want to include it, you know, that's kind of a bad position for it. So moving it over to the left might be a little bit better. And then raising it back and above so that there's a little negative shape there, I think could work a little bit better as well so that it's not breaking that ground plane. Um, here I'm turning off the layer of, of the original so we can kind of see what's going on. And... I mean, there we have our basic layout of the still life. 
and we can be pretty sure that nothing is passing through each other on the ground and that the architecture of the still life kind of makes sense. Um, you know, everything would need a little more refinement, right, before we go further with it and take it to finish. But in terms of a layout, this tells us a lot of what's going to go on with the drawing as it progresses through the the stages of finish and more layers. So I think uh, this to me is a useful place to have a, have a still life early on because we can see where it's going without tons of time sunk into it. And I think that's the advantage to a process where you've run through the sketch, the study, and the finished piece or project phase because you're never at a loss of where to go next. You, And the other thing that's interesting too is with this sort of process, you can cycle back through. Like if you do your sketch and it doesn't really work out, um, you just do another sketch. If you go into the study phase where you're kind of laying everything out for the first time and it doesn't work out, you can go back to sketches, do another study, or just go from study to do another study and try something different. The apple is another thing entirely. Um, what it is, it's basically a, a sphere. And if we're drawing instead of rendering, we want to get to the essence of the of that sphere really quickly. And so we would divide that, find its hemisphere where it separates light and dark, and do that. In anime and stuff like that, you actually see shapes like that where you see basically a, a light and a dark side, and there's not a lot of rendering involved. Um, we could be way more careful with that and do like lots of cross hatching and so on. And dividing up that light and dark half has to do with this warm up exercise that I'm currently going through. Um, and this is what we call a straight in, straight out exercise. It's where you go straight off the edge, arc across, and then go straight back in. And I'm doing kind of badly going slow, so speeding up for me helps with the elegance of that line. And I think relaxation is a big part of this exercise too, so that you stay, your hand is physically relaxed, you're relaxed, and you're just going across and going across and going across, straight in and straight out. And this is gonna help you render everything that's rounded and draw everything that's rounded because you want those arcs that you draw across round objects to be really fluid and I guess beautiful in a way. Even if the outer contour is not perfect, if you can do these arcs really well and remind yourself and your viewers where that is, it's going to work out nicely. Once you find where the, the separation of light and dark is, you can construct with tangent lines where the shadow is going to be. So because that arc comes down in front of us, we know that the light is kind of coming from front to back. So the shadow is going to kind of go at a diagonal from lower left to upper right in this particular situation. Now, to make this an apple, we need to do a little bit more work. We need to put the place where the stem is and create a little subform because it's kind of dipping down like like a cone that's cut out of the sphere, right? And then we need to wrap that around. Apples aren't always spheres though, but we can kind of think spheres. You know, this form could be a certain breed of apple um, or a certain species of apple, I guess, brand, and but it could also be used to create like a bell pepper or something if you change the the stem. Sometimes you really see these like segments in apples where it's like really obvious that each segment has its own life. And essentially what, what you're doing with that is wrapping that line around the form, almost like you're doing a cross contour. So you're finding these, these landmark areas and then you're thinking about the basic form. You're thinking pulling up around a cone and then coming back down into the spherical nature of the apple, right? You want to avoid that straight up and down straight line in the front and the back. So, because that's going to basically make it flat. And if you use straight lines, that's like the um, equator almost looking at a dead on, that's going to divide it in a non-dimensional way. Here, 
we have a weird situation because the apple looks like it has light coming from the the top left but then the shadows over on the left side so if it's coming from the top left we should have the shadow on the right side so looking at at your your apple we we can probably modify this a bit and just make it a little bit um, more reasonable in terms of its lighting scheme um, and remember this goes back to the five value system that we were talking about earlier in the video where we have our five pieces of shadow anatomy and five values we got our drop shadow or cast shadow we have our highlights and our whites we got our tone which is just our overall shadow side tone we have our shadow core which is the darkest part of a shadow on an object where the light hits at an oblique angle or tangent and then we have our half tone which is the sort of transitionary tones within our light side of, of an object where it's going to read as, as having light on it but it's not going to be full white and it's not going to read as the tone so we can dab each one of those and kind of start making some decisions about where they go so here I'm using a, a hard edge sort of graphic style. So we're going to make a very clear statement and a very clear decision about where that tone is. And it's going to go right along that line that I drew around that, around that um, arc that goes all the way across using the straight in straight out warm up. And then I'm going to do a softer core tone um, so that it, it looks a little blended and because one of the things that happens is if you have a hard edge within the shadows on a form, it kind of starts to break apart because the form shadow sh probably should not be super harsh um, and super linear. I mean, you can get it to work, especially if you're drawing something that's more robotic and mechanical and technical. Um, here, we're going to throw in a couple of highlights just to map them and so because we're in that cone we might find a highlight in that within that cone somewhere we're gonna get a big highlight on the apple right near um, the the sort of closest point to the light source and we're gonna map out these values this isn't a rendering thing this is more value mapping like I, like I've said before we're just kind of laying out where these values go because our main thing is to determine where the light is, where the highlight is, where the tone is, where the core is, and where the where the cast shadow is. If we can do that, we're kind of set up to finish out this apple however we want. We could spend the time rendering it from here. We could add color and paint it. We could uh, flatten it out, make it more graphic. We could, you know, do things with line work. We could cross hatch it and. We could take it in any direction that we want from here with this mapped value on top of it. And I think that's what's interesting about drawing as opposed to rendering is because we're not stuck with a particular way of working. We can track those tangents out and then start to develop that cast shadow like we were talking about earlier. So here it's sort of front lit at a 45 degree angle. So we want to just throw, make sure our shadow gets thrown back from the apple. There's going to be a super dark part of it right at the bottom. We could um, include some reflected light. Sometimes you get on reflective surfaces, you'll get the super dark value reflected on the object too. So you might find little dark patches in the bottom of it. It's kind of a rendering thing though. Here we can just go for the punch of having a super dark value right under this apple. You know, and the other thing too is like this shadow would change value depending on the value of the surface under it. Like if it's a black table, it could be like that. But if it's a white table, it, you might have to lift that value a little bit. It just depends. So a lot of this is just about paying attention to the, to the circumstances and how you're kind of handling everything. Um, we can change the style at any point and make it uh, have soft edges or harsher edges. We can use harsh edges and blend a little more. It just depends on where you want to where you want to take it and what you want to look what you want this thing to look like in the end. Um, you can actually probably lose some edges right into the shadows, especially if you're working 
with multiple objects or still life and you're trying to create a certain mood. We could bring some dark values into the shadow core tone and um, push that shadow core darker than it, uh, than it should be. Um, a lot of these are just stylistic decisions. We're here, we're reflecting some darks onto that, uh, onto the bottom of the apple to kind of unify everything. We can borrow a little halftone to bump up reflected light and then push it back down. Um, it just really depends on how you want to do that. And then if we do the zoom out test, right, where, where if we're with a physical drawing, we get six to 10 feet away, look at it. If it makes sense from that distance, you know, you're doing something right. Then you just go up close and make sure that everything continues to be right as you get closer and closer and closer. We can tone things down, we can blend edges and sort of style this out in any way that we want from here. So here I'm showing you multiple options on the same thing. So it looks a little bit of like this Frankenstein apple, <laughs> which is fine. Uh, I think, um, you know, with your practice, you could do several different versions of an apple, one with graphic, one with blended, you know, one with like bumped up shadow cores, one with a subtle shadow core. You could try it with as little value contrast as possible, as much value contrast as possible. There's so many ways to go about this that your options are, are pretty unlimited as far as where you can, where you can take this particular piece. And, um, I think the strength of what you've, what you've showed me is that you're willing to put in the time, you know, if you're spending a couple of hours to do something, I think that's great. I think I answered all the questions. Um, you know, I think we didn't talk about your goal. It's like, it's totally well-defined to want to be able to draw forms and capture values. I mean, I think that's like the first goal is just to capture forms and the way to get about, get to it is to kind of constantly cycle through all these basics and keep reminding yourself of the basics, right? You've got your lines, your shapes, your forms, right? You got, um, and you can practice that with a bunch of like warm up exercises. You can just draw these forms freely and invent them. You can simplify it complicated things down to the most basic form that you see one of the one of the basic forms and all of these videos to practice that are already on the channel so you can um, you can go back and kind of look at those but this is kind of like synthesizing a lot of that information and putting it into um, the exact problems that you're facing right now so um, what I like is that you're dedicated and that you're spending the time um, I think you can speed up and get more done in the same amount of time like if you're uh, set a timer and say like I'm gonna draw this one form like this one mushroom and I'm setting a 10 minute timer and that's it and then I'm gonna move on no matter how far I am um, or say five minutes you know just say I just want to set up the line work I'm setting a timer for five minutes and then I'm gonna do it again you know turn the mushroom do it again get a different mushroom reference do it again um, and those are really good ways to begin to sketch it so I hope that helped, and I, I hope um, some other people will get some benefit out of this as well. Uh, so thank you again for sending work in, and thanks for working hard.